Welcome to the Conversations with Jesus podcast. I'm Johnny Lehman, a baptized man of God who has the amazing blessings of being a husband, father, and the pastor at Divine Savior Church in West Palm Beach, Florida. This podcast is designed to bring you the self-sacrificing love of Jesus found in the Bible through 15 to 20 minute episodes that focus on relevant life issues and what God has to say about them. Check out our website, DivineSaviorChurch.com, as well as our Facebook and Instagram pages if you'd like to find out more about the incredible things that God is doing through our church family. Ever since September, we've been going through the book of Proverbs and seeing how God's wisdom helps us navigate all the complexities of life. Well, this week we finish our series on Proverbs before we go into an Advent focus. We go into the prophet Isaiah and some of his prophecies concerning Jesus and the Savior he would be. But to finish our series on Proverbs, is so fitting as we go into Thanksgiving, we're going to reflect on the relationships that God has given to us. Now, it's easy to believe that relationships succeed, aka they're so awesome, or they fail, they're so miserable because of the other person. In contrast, the book of Proverbs teaches that what's in our heart determines the nature of the relationship. So as we finish our journey through Proverbs, we're going to learn what this amazing book of the Bible has to say about the enemy of relationships, the source of healing for relationships, and the path to restoration for relationships. I cannot wait to unpack this incredibly important part of the Bible with you. These are the Proverbs that we're especially going to be looking at as we consider what God's wisdom in Proverbs has to say about restoring relationships. Whoever conceals hatred with lying lips and spreads slander is a fool. Whoever derides their neighbor has no sense, but the one who has understanding holds their tongue. A gossip betrays a confidence, but a trustworthy person keeps a secret. Whoever would foster love covers over an offense, but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. Do not gloat when your enemy falls. When they stumble, do not let your heart rejoice, for the Lord will see and disapprove and turn his wrath away from them. Do not testify against your neighbor without cause. Would you use your lips to mislead? Do not say, I'll do to them as they have done to me. I'll pay them back for what they did. What you have seen with your eyes, do not bring hastily to court. For what will you do in the end if your neighbor puts you to shame? If you take your neighbor to court, do not betray another's confidence, or the one who hears it may shame you and the charge against you will stand. If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. This is God's word. Growing up, my family had a Thanksgiving tradition where each of us would have four corn kernels and we would go around the table talking about the four things we were most thankful for. Now, if I haven't told you already, my family has a, oh, how do I put this? We have a serious struggle with sarcasm (laughs) and undoubtedly my poor parents would have to put up with some silly responses from my brothers. Never me, of course. That was not true. But when things finally got serious, Can you guess without fail what caused the most thanksgiving? Any ideas? People. The relationships in our lives. Those human beings who have put up with us and who have loved us. We long for relationships. And of course, our Heavenly Father knows that. That's how He's wired us. And that's why He's excited to give you wisdom when it comes to the relationships in your life. Now remember how the Bible defines wisdom. Grace given competency in navigating life's complexity. So, this means it's that being wise is more than just being moral. It's not less than that, but wisdom is about, it's so much more than that. It's about so much more than merely knowing the rules. Wisdom is knowing what to do, how to do it, and when to do it. And this wisdom couldn't be more essential in how we think about relationships. As we consider Thanksgiving and we praise and thank Jesus for the people he has blessed us with in our lives. I don't know about you, but I can't help but think about the people in my life where the connection isn't what it used to be, or it never materialized like I hoped it would. You know, maybe as you think of your closest relationships, Thanksgiving 
isn't what comes to mind, but frustration or even anger or sadness. You keep wishing things would be mended, but you're feeling more and more distant. We all have relationships in need of restoration, of repair. So what does God's wisdom have to say about that? A few hugely important things. For us to experience God's wisdom in our relationships, to witness relationships repaired and restored, we first need to confront our spiritual superiority complex. Now, a spiritual superiority complex happens when we are not thankful not as much, we are not thankful as much for the person herself, but we're thankful for the benefits that person is giving us. In other words, we look at that person and think, if you give me fill in the blank, I will have a connection with you. Once you stop giving me fill in the blank, we're through. Have you seen this in our culture or heard it? I mean, just listen to two sections of songs in the Billboard Top 10 right now, and listen especially to how transactional we tend to be in our relationships. Here's some lines from the song Snooze by SZA. Ain't a home when you're not here. Hard to grow up when you're not here. How can you blame it on me and you the main one lying? How are you threatening to leave and I'm the main one crying? Just trying to be your everything. Now, apparently the word trina, that's T-R-Y-N-A, that's become a new word. So trina, use that, your teens. If you have teens or grandkids who are teens, they'll think you're super hip. But can you see the superiority complex in those lines? What is he saying? I'm relying on you for my safety. He says, ain't a home when you're not here. He's saying, you're my safety. You're my growth in life. I'm trying to be your everything. And you're just going to walk away? You see that transactional thing going on there? It's not loving the person to love them. It's loving the person what he can give you. Another example, this time from the world of T. Swift, Taylor Swift. She sings, I'm standing on the sidewalk alone. I wait for you to drive by. I'm trying to, there it is again, I'm trying to see the cards that you won't show. I'm about to fold unless, unless you say don't go. Again, what is the point? I will not stay at your side unless you do this for me. Don't fail me or I'm gone. And of course, how different this is from our God. When it comes to his relationship with us, it's a completely one-sided transaction. He gives everything. We receive it all. We be, he became nothing. So we could become, or we could have everything. We were once his enemies. or He gave his life for us to make us his friends. And just think about it logically. What did God stand to gain from a relationship with us? It would seem, humanly speaking, like nothing. But in his heart, we are everything to him. He chose to know you fully and to love you with the only purely unconditional love ever known. He made this world with you in his heart. He then created you, saved you, and continues to refine you simply out of joy and love for you. Not transactional at all. Pure grace. Because he knows He knows if we try to live life without a deep connection to him, life shatters like glass on tile, right? It's the pure truth. Relationships make or break your life. And how you see yourself in the relationship dictates so much. It doesn't matter what kind of relationship it is, romantic or platonic, how you see yourself really defines the relationship. Because if if you view yourself as the superior partner in the relationship, Proverbs 11, 12 becomes commonplace. Whoever derides their neighbor has no sense, but the one who has understanding holds their tongue. Now, derision is to look down at someone, down on someone, as an unworthy person. If you see yourself as superior and they fail you, you respond with anger. Now, the thing is, you can't, you really can't be angry if you see someone as less than you. It's only when you feel superior, you experience that anger. This is also where Proverbs 10.18 comes into play. Whoever conceals hatred with lying lips and spreads slander is a fool. When you see yourself as superior, you tend to be far more receptive to hatred taking over your life. Hatred in Proverbs is defined as ill will. It's not as much seething rage as we tend to visualize hatred. And ill will is when you begin to find happiness in your own happiness. In other words, you gloat when your enemy falls. When you see someone and you have ill will, when they mess up or get put down, you like it. And so ill will is intentionally letting someone go down a destructive path simply so you can gain happiness from their unhappiness. 
And this is why Jesus later on gives such a strong warning about the sin of hate. It has a way of consuming you from the inside out. And this can easily lead to slander. Now, slander is not just a lie. It's any kind of bad report. It's ill will. Words said to cut down people, which breaks down relationships and eventually communities like families and church families. And this is why we must confront the foolishness of our sin. Because as Proverbs talks about, being a fool isn't simply being brainless. It's being destructive. Now, where, of course, does this foolishness come from? From our sin-stained heart. All of our hearts, right? The, the Bible says the heart is more than just our emotions. It's the core of who we are, right? It's the core of our being. Sin makes us want to be superior, to justify ourselves and, and call the shots in our lives, ultimately. It's the desire to take the throne of God because of our innate insecurity. And because we're so insecure, we feel tempted to cut others down with the vain hope that we can look just a little bit better. And so we betray confidence. Why? To boost our brand. We gloat when someone falls because it makes us pseudo-thankful for our personal greatness. We hold back, lovingly addressing someone we love about the sin struggles they have because whether we admit it or not, we kind of enjoy seeing them fail. I mean, isn't this the sickness of sin at its height? Self-consumed spiritual superiority? You'll live life thinking that person will let you down, and so what do you do? Well, you'll go from career to career, and shockingly, you'll find more people who will fail you to the point that you lose thankfulness in God too. Why? Well, because he just doesn't seem to understand what you need. But it's when the Lord brings us to this convicting realization, how the law stares us in the face, that sin's blinders drop to the ground, and we can see people who they really are. But for us to see people who they really are, the law can't do this. To, can't do that for us. It's a viewpoint we can only see through Jesus. When we realize how sin has so radically affected our view of relationships, it's at this very moment we need to hear how God would have us see the people in our lives. How does God's grace accomplish this? Well, consider C.S. Lewis's words from his book, The Weight of Glory. That's what he says. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, art, civilizations, these are mortal, and their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. But as immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit, immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. Now put simply, imagine how different our relationships would be if we saw people for who they really are, walking immortals alongside us. But here's the rub on our own. We can't. Talk about the least inspiring thing I could say, right? Nope, you can't. Seriously, you and I can't. Not only are we so, so often transactional and not thankful in our relationships, we we're also transactional in how we handle people wronging us. We want the punishment to fit the crime. Look at Proverbs 28 verse 29. Look at the warning. Do not say, I'll do to them as they have done to me. I'll pay them back for what they did. Or consider Proverbs 24, 17 and 18. Do not gloat when your enemy falls. When they stumble, do not let your heart rejoice. Or the Lord will see and disapprove and turn his wrath away from them. No, maybe that last part of the verse, right? So, in other words, when it says, okay, don't gloat because if you do, the Lord will see you're gloating and he'll disapprove and then he'll turn his wrath away from them. Isn't there a part of you thinking, okay, so what you're saying is, God, if I'm nice to them, then you're going to bring the pain in revenge. <laughs> do you see how we struggle with this? Here again, what I said before. When it comes to restoring our relationships fully, you and I can't. We just can't. The good news for us is that someone did. And he continues to do so. Remember earlier, so if you weren't in worship with us, we, the other reading we had this Sunday was Romans 12, verses 9 through 21. And Paul quotes Deuteronomy 32, verse 35, which says this. He's talking about how we love our neighbor. And he says, this is what the Lord says, vengeance is mine. I will repay. So God is saying, I will take the vengeance. I will repay it. You know, for the longest time, I took that verse transactionally thinking, okay, so I guess I'll try to love that person who slighted me because I know God will take care of justice later. He will give them what they deserve. But after going through Proverbs this week and really thinking about that verse in Romans, I, we're missing the heart of what God is saying here. 
when he says, vengeance is mine. This is God literally saying, this vengeance, the vengeance that sin deserves, the justice that needs to be paid, it's mine to handle. God says, I'll take the vengeance. I'll own it. The very God who promises vengeance for the injustices of sin took it upon himself. It's at the cross of Jesus where justice and mercy meet. It's there that we see the ultimate superior being in the universe, outside of time and space, make himself so small, so lowly, so humble, to die the most humiliating, unjust, and heart-wrenching death the world would ever see. And he did all that. Why? Because he wanted to have a relationship with you. A relationship that would remove the dogging quest of self-justification before yourself and before your world. And to give you an identity, a rock-solid one, based solely on the God of I've done it all for you, Grace. The theologian Johann Gerhard, long t- centuries ago, he said this in his book called The Handbook of Consolations. It's beautiful. He said, The Lord laid on him as a stream made to rush headlong onto him the sins of us all. So hide yourself in his wounds. And the storm of divine wrath will pass over you. Isaiah 53 thoughts, right? The Lord became the suffering servant who took all our punishment, not only so you never would, but so you could know and love him for who he truly is. He is the God who lowered himself to less than nothing so you could have the most complete life a person could know. He made you his superior priority, willing to give up his life you could truly have life. It's God's untransactional relationship with you that makes you untransactionally thankful. Because after all, Jesus has given you everything. And we stand in total wonder at his self-giving love. When we see such wonder by faith, we see the wonder of every relationship. By faith, we are blessings to those who try to hurt us. We are willing to associate with people of quote-unquote low position, as Romans 12 talks about it. And consider, we consider everyone above us. And we heap burning coals on their heads, as both Proverbs and Paul talk about. We kill them with kindness. We don't expect from people. We serve people. What does this look like? When we live by God's grace, knowing how God sees us, knowing who God is and what he's done, we tear down our expectations for the kind of parent our parents should be, or the kind of child our children should be or the kind of boss she should be, or the kind of co-worker he should be, or the kind of boyfriend he should be, the kind of wife she should be. And we simply say thank you, God, for giving us an audience with even that person who annoys us the most. <laughs> because we've been given the opportunity of a lifetime to be a servant like our Savior. When we approach relationships with this grace-given wisdom of God to expect nothing from it but simply the joy of following Jesus, you know what happens? You find yourself more and more thankful for that person. You're more open to seeing the gifts God has given to them and, and rejoicing because of it. You're open to being there for them. And by God's grace, not only do you appreciate their different blessings, their God-given abilities, you're also ready to do the most loving thing in the world. You're ready to lovingly confront them when they're caught in the snare of sin. Because remember again, according to the Bible, what is at the core of hatred? It's allowing someone to go down a path you know will be destructive, and you let them go down that path to kindle the flames of your inner spiritual superiority complex. When you see everyone as being above you, as people you want to love, as people you want to bring to Jesus, you're given a boldness, a willingness to speak truth into their darkness. Not to deride them, not to judge them on your terms. You say these things, speaking the truth in love, and sometimes we got to be direct. We do this all so that they would turn back to their king, their king Jesus, who died for his subjects, so you and I could live in joy and thanksgiving all our days in a rock solid relationship with Jesus. Rock solid because it all revolves around his undeserved, whole, and selfless love for us. It's here we find the heart of God's wisdom we've been running to ever since we started this path through Proverbs. That true wisdom is really as simple as this. Desiring Jesus above anyone or anything else in your life. When you long for him, when you welcome him into all your life situations, when you find in him your strength, your vision, your certainty, 
you see things for what they really are. You love people as they need to be loved, all because you know your Savior. And because you know Him, you know who you are. A blood-bought child of God who has nothing less to live for than pure, unhindered joy. Amen. Again, it's just a joy for me to get to be in the Word with you, even from afar. Thank you so much for listening. I pray that you have safe travels if you're going anywhere for Thanksgiving. But above all, continue to cling to Jesus, your Savior who will never let you down, your Savior who is preparing a place for you, your Savior who has nothing but joy. He is our rock, our redeemer, our everything. God's richest blessings as you live for Him now and always. Thank you.